This is our August, yes, August Barkabout. Uh, today we're going to do a conifer hike. So we're going to talk ID and we'll talk ecology of trees. Um, and again, bring your stories, bring whatever you have to share about, about that because that's really, really valuable to this. Um, I know if a lot of you have some experience with trees and some knowledge and please impart that. It's going to enrich everyone's experience. Um, but before we kind of get into trees and ecology, um, like I said earlier, we also need to talk about what is happening in this area. Um, because when we talk about the ecology of trees, we talk about the stories that they have to tell. But a big part of that story is uh, the human impacts on the lands too. And um, that's why I kind of brought you here today. Um, where we're at is a proposed sale. Pretty much everything right behind us is one of the units of the Red Hill timber sale. Um, Bark has been involved in the Red Hill timber sale for about a year now. Uh, the Mount Hood National Forest put forth a, a collaborative group, a group of interested individuals, uh, to look at doing a restoration proposal up in Mount Hood. And Bark, we, we, our motto is to restore and protect Mount Hood, so restoration sounded pretty good. Um, so when we came initially, there was about 3,000 acres of uh, timber proposed to be caught up here. And so when we first looked at that, there was a few red flags that really jumped out at us. Um, the first thing that came out was it was 450 acres of uh, habitat improvement. These were 110-year-old stands that had never been logged before that they wanted to go in and thin out a bit and create snags, which basically means kill live trees, in order to create, in order to create habitat for, um, for woodpeckers and uh, particularly pine martens. Um, so that seemed a little bit alarming to us to be going in there and doing, um, uh, doing that kind of work, logging in native forests uh, for habitat. Generally, when you leave these forests alone, there's competition that happens. And some of those trees get shaded out, and they die. They get, um, they get fungus in them. They get bugs in them. Woodpeckers start pecking on them. It creates cavities, and that creates habitat. So if we leave that natural process alone, we get habitat in time. Usually what happens is when you create a snag or you create a standing dead tree, you girdle the tree, so you create a ring about six inches all the way across the tree, which it effectively kills the tree, but you don't have fungus in there and you don't have bugs that get in there, so it, it makes it not habitat until that process occurs. And then where you create that girdle, where you create that line, is it often creates a weak spot in the tree and that tree is more susceptible to fall. So we were able to present that, that case to, to, um, to the Hood River Ranger District, and that portion of the sale was dropped. So we were pretty pleased with that. Um, <laughs> the other proportion was uh, a huckleberry enhancement. And this was way up the ridge, way up, um, up towards, the, um, towards the trailhead up ahead on 1650. And what they wanted to do was thin the forest to 30%. So basically, like looking around here, they would take out seven, 10 trees and thin those out so that the huckleberries and the understory would unfortunately respond to that and, um, and thrive and flourish and produce more berries. So that was a little bit more complicated because there are indigenous treaty rights where Native Americans, uh, Mountain National Forest has to provide huckleberry habitat for Native Americans. But when we were looking on the map, we saw that this was on the top of the ridge, about 6,000 feet. The adjacent ridge over is ironically called Blowdown Ridge. So blowdown is when trees, high wind storms, they fall down, right? So where this huckleberry enhancement was happening was high up on the top of the ridge. And when you, when you thin the forest about 30%, taking away 70% of the trees, the wind's gonna rip through there much quicker. Um, and if you lose all the forest on an exposed ridge, it's gonna be much harder for the, uh, the forest to recover in those areas. So we made a counter proposal to try and get some of these plantations opened up as a uh, huckleberry enhancement instead. And so that's still on the table, and we'll see how that, what comes of that um, when the environmental assessment comes out. So for now, um, we have no environmental assessment. We're in the scoping period of this sale. Um, and basically what that means, the scoping period, is a point in time in which the Forest Service just sends out a map and maybe a two-page letter that says, somewhere in this area, we're going to do this and that. And there's not a lot of details. And I think this is a really great place if you're new to Bark or if you're new to the work we do, um, a really great place to enter into these projects. Because during the scoping period, when you want to be involved in public lands management, you don't have to have the answers, right? All you have to do is be curious and add, ask really good questions. Because what the scoping period allows is for the public to come out 
and see what they're proposing and to ask questions. When the environmental assessment comes out, that's what comes out after the scoping period, and this is a 100 to a 200 page document, and that, gets, that goes to the nitty gritty. That's all the details that list the environmental effects of logging in this area. So when that comes out, the game changes a little bit. Then you're going back and saying, well, I don't believe with this claim, or you should read this science study, it's different than what you say. And so it gets a little bit more fine-tuned. But at this point in time, we just have to ask really good questions. So that's kind of what we'll be doing today when we walk throughout this area, just kind of um, looking around and imagining what it would look like if they would log and kind of think how that would change the ecosystem. And since we're talking about conifers, we'll kind of couch it in that today too. How will those trees be affected? You know, would they respond favorable to that? Could they suffer from that? There's trades off in, in any, any activity that we do. So we'd like to explore some of those concepts today too. Whew, I said a lot. Do you guys have any questions? Was that all private land we drove through that was so butchered? County, and uh, there's some private, some Longview lands tucked in there too that we might have seen. Um, county and private lands, yeah. A lot of that was for service land and got traded for land in the scenic area. The scenic area meaning uh, the little the, uh, the Columbia River Gorge scenic area. Oh, okay. There was private land in the scenic area that you know they either had to buy or trade, and so this whole area, and it's been badly stripped you know, over the last 20 years because of that. And here's the town of Hood River. Uh, we came down Highway 35 just a wee bit, and we got on a road called Eric Hill Road, which isn't on our road, which isn't on our map, excuse me. And we basically just jogged across and got on this road, which is Highway 282, which you can take from Hood River as well, just uh, for the sake of not losing people, we, we went down 35 a bit and jogged over here on Summit Road. Um, we came down here through the town of D, and we got on uh, Highway 13, or excuse me, Forest Service Road 13, and we went down to where it connects right here with Forest Service Road 18. Some of you may know Forest Service Road is Lolo Pass. This road continues on and will connect with Highway 26 and take you down to the town of Rhododendron. Um, off of 18, we turned on Forest Hill, or excuse me, Forest Road 16, and right here is the Red Hill planning area, and that's where we're at at this point in time. Um, we'll get to see it a little bit later, but there's one butte just across the way there. It's called Butcher Knife Butte. And on the other side of that is Lost Lake. So a lot of people might know where Lost Lake is. We're, we're very near there. It'd be about a 10, 15 minute drive from where we're at right now. You said that those plantations, that they, they, you want to trade off the plantations in order to, to provide the huckleberry habitat in plantations. Pretty much when they do those clear cuts to create plantations, there's no huckleberry left. So how do they expect that to take off growing there? That's a good question. You know, a lot of it too, huckleberry habitat. Huckleberries in general respond really heavily with fire. Um, so in a lot of areas, there was one person that was on the stewardship committee who was talking about how they did similar programs in the Gifford Pin Show. And when they did log, they followed that with, up, up with fire. Um, and that's what Native Americans did up here when they wanted to regenerate uh, huckleberries is they would burn these ridges. So when we were talking about this project, we basically said, well, we should do more research on this before we we thin a, an exposed ridge that drastically. Uh, we should look at you know other options on the table, uh, especially in light of that. Have um, you gone back and taken into consideration the uh, Dollar Lake fire? Yeah, that was another point too. It's like we had the recent Dollar Lake fire, and then the year prior or two years prior, we had the Gnarl yeah. Ridge fire. So we thought we should go back and look at those areas because. Um, for, for those of you who know, there was a massive fire on Mount Hood, the Dollar Lake fire, and uh, the Red Hill project goes right up to it. There wasn't any, actually any fires in the Red Hill timber cell units, but they go about a quarter mile from the area. So we, we had said that, yeah, you should go back in there and see how Huckleberry is responding to that. Yeah, it, it seems that oh, uh, just about everything that's touted as sustainable forestry is not sustainable forestry, and that it's just for the interest of uh, the logging companies. Is there such thing as sustainable forestry, really and truly? And what would that look like? I mean, I, I, that's a very broad question, but... Let's walk around a little bit and, um, and explore that, because I think that's a really brilliant concept. And um, Yeah, so let, let's do that, because that, that's an awesome question, and that's a big reason why I wanted to bring you all here today. So mm -hmm. uh, we can talk about that a lot, because a lot of these projects that are happening up here are cited as restoration. So I think that's a really... Um, important point and a really good uh, concept to explore. Um, so yeah, that all said, um, 
Sometimes huckleberries just reach a point where they're not as productive, and so burning them off, they will come back from that root crown, so it doesn't kill them completely. So it just kind of rejuvenates the plants. Yeah. And so sometimes without that rejuvenation, you just don't get that. And when you thin a forest for huckleberry habitat, generally what they found is um, it's not that many years later that the canopy closes again. And so the huckleberries have to contend with, you know, the compacted soils and things like that, but they're not getting that long-term boom. Um, if you were going to do something like that, it would probably, in the interest of huckleberries, it would probably look like falling trees, um, you know, some dude out there with a chainsaw or what have you, and then maybe burning the areas. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, again, we're, we're getting those fires that are happening naturally up there. So right. hopefully that's getting the huckleberries to, to respond I've well. Been standing here for 800 years. And if I had me some eyes, they'd be welling up with tears. got my roots deep in the earth so I'll just stand right here and wait now you folks ain't got no time to waste something must be done I just stand here and take my fate because I can run I cannot And this that we've been walking on is a road. This is an open road. Uh, you can drive cars down it, whatever you want. Um, but the good news is, is that the Forest Service is planning on, um, after this project is done, they plan on decommissioning this road. So they are gonna go through, you know, when they generate money from logging, they'll use some of that proceeds to decommission this road. So basically what they'll do is they'll, um, they'll take a rototiller well, it's not a rototiller, but you know what I mean. Like, it's like a massive machine that's like a rototiller. It'll churn up the soil, expose the rocks, and make it um, so that trees can take root, like uh, these alders here and stuff. So while they do open up these roads to log, the good news is that they're going to decommission it. They're going to use the proceeds from logging to decommission this road. Anyone see a problem with that? It's already been done. Yeah. And so we've been having this... This has been a big problem that we've been seeing, especially with sales like the Jazz Timber Sale. Um, Bark worked really hard to secure these funds called um, Money for Legacy Roads. Basically what's happening right now is the Forest Service, um, well, across the board, they don't have the, the, the manpower to do the work that they need to do. So, um, especially along roads, they have a backlog of road maintenance that they can't keep up with. So Bark and some of our um, conservation allies worked to get money from Congress to get money for Mount Hood National Forest to close roads. And we thought that would be great. And we thought that, you know, we could get a lot of these roads closed that, that weren't needed, that weren't system roads, um, off of the framework so that they wouldn't have to do maintenance on it. And it's pretty amazing, like, I, uh, the stat from the Jazz Timber Sale was like, it's, um, it's about $16,000 a year um, to do maintenance on some of the miles of roads and the Kalawash, which the Kalawash is a special feature. It's got a lot of landslide issues. But then it's like $30,000 to $40,000 to close the road permanently. So in two or three years of closing a road, you already reap the benefits of that. And you all know why they keep these roads intact. We know why this is still a system road. Right? <laughs> so the logging trucks can get in. Yeah. 
But when we look at this on the ground, this road is, it's, that's ecologically pretty stable. You know, when they put a road, and you, you could probably see as we walk through there, we're on a hill slope like this. And when they put in a road, what they have to do is you have to cut into the side of this hill and then basically fill in this side to create a level surface. And when they ripped this, they did a great job. And you can see that the hill slope is kind of contouring. You guys might have noticed it felt kind of like you were walking like this through a great portion of that trail. And the, so the road is starting to, you know, it's basically starting to adjust back to that slope. Um, these alders, I know I said I was only going to talk about conifers today, but alders are really kick-ass. They fix nitrogen. Um, so they're here replenishing the soil, putting nitrogen back in the soil, um, doing all that great stuff to rehab this soil. So eventually other conifers, yep, see there they are, conifers <laughs> then can come in and, and reclaim these roads. So basically by allowing this unit to go through, we are going to be setting back all the ecological work that's been done up here. And this section of road is 2.1 miles. So we just walked, I don't know, not too far. So it continues like this for quite some ways. Um, we also have a stream crossing right here. And if you look on your map, you want to, you can, because I passed them out so you could. Um, we're on road 1670, and it's basically right above where your map says T1SR85E. And you can see unit 31 and 22. And the, we're right at that stream crossing right there. But you can see this road goes down for quite a ways past this. And we have headwaters of three more creeks that, that cross this road. Now, hopefully they're probably not going to be going down way down this road because, um, you know, there's not any units down there. But it showed on this project that there'd be 2.1 miles of roads decommissioned on this. So I'm curious to see what that looks like. And when, the, and when we're, they're touting this project as we're going to decommission roads, uh, it looks pretty great on paper. They're doing 12 miles of decommissioning roads. But when 2.1 looks like this, it kind of raises some concerns there. How many of those 12 miles are not already decommissioned? So it kind of taps into your question there a little bit, like what is restoration? Um, and roads are a, a major impact. These roads persist on the landscape for years and years and years. Um, and often that is more of a concern um, in the long term ecologically, maybe than thinning is. Because these roads are essentially kept as permanent clear cuts. The soils are super compacted. A lot of sediment runs right off those roads. And in this case, the sediment goes right into a creek. Questions? Uh, you mentioned you one problem that they had with this. Another problem is you said that, uh, did I get it right, that they, they're going to take the proceeds from these timber sales to decommission the roads, and don't uh -huh. they typically lose money on these timber sales? Yeah. So how are they going to get proceeds to do something that they lose the money on? Yeah, and that, that is a good point because you will see it in the scoping notice when it says they're going to do decommissioning roads. It says wind funds are available. Um, and we did see that in the Kalawash that the Legacy Roads program evidently got cut because they're not doing road closures up in the Kalawash at this point in time, uh, which is pretty sad. And, uh, you know, we've got some digging to do into that, but it could be for those reasons that Congress is like, well, if you're just reopening up those roads again, why should we fund that? Um, but yeah, it's, it's well known that the Forest Service has been losing money for, for years. Yeah. Um, I don't know uh, Mount Hood statistics. They're a little behind on budget keeping. But in, um, in the Salem Bureau of the BLM, BLM does a lot of logging in our area on the west side. It was something like they, um, they spent $36 million in planting timber sales and $12 million in receipts. So it is a sizable portion of money that's going into, uh, into doing this work, well, you know, at taxpayer expense. It's the government. Yeah. Yeah. It's They're going to take the proceeds from these timber sales to decommission the roads. And don't uh -huh. they typically lose money on these timber sales? Yeah. So how are they going to get proceeds to do something that they're losing money on? Yeah, and that, that is a good point because you will see it in the scoping notice when it says they're going to do decommissioning roads. It says wind funds are available. Um, and we did see that in the Kalawash that the Legacy Roads program evidently got cut because they're not doing road closures up in the Kalawash at this point in time, uh, which is pretty sad. And, uh, you know, we've got some digging to do into that, but it could be for those reasons that Congress is like, well, if you're just reopening up those roads again, why should we fund that? Um, but yeah, it's, it's well known that the Forest Service has been losing money for, for years. Yeah. Um, I don't know uh, Mount Hood statistics. They're a little behind on budget keeping. But in, um, in the Salem Bureau of the BLM, 
BLM does a lot of logging in our area on the west side. It was something like they, um, they spent $36 million in planting timber sales and $12 million in receipts. So it is a sizable portion of money that's going into, uh, into doing this work, well, you know, at taxpayer expense. It's the government. Yeah. Yeah, it's the government. I don't think it is a drinking water source for folks. Okay. Um, I did look um, on the ODFW site, and they're not allowing fishing in there for endangered stocks of uh, steelhead and salmon. So I would assume that there's something going on with that. And so sediment is obviously an issue there and something that we'll want to look at further. It's bad for the fish, too. Yeah. Right? And, and when the, when the um, environmental assessment comes out, we'll get that detailed analysis, like what would be the impacts to salmon and steelhead. But at this point, like again, at that scoping point, it's just something where we look on a map and go, okay, yeah, we see these creeks um, right above there. It's on a pretty steep slope. You know, what is the impact of that? And by asking those questions, that is supposed to make the Forest Service analyze those. Um, and especially when you look at your map, if you look at where the West Fork Hood River is on your map, you can see there's a lot of units that are right above it, particularly um, unit 50 and 44. And those are on pretty steep slopes too. So those are two that kind of stand out for me. Um, those two are also cited as forest health, um, which is different than where we're at, where these are plantations. <laughs> these are trees where they said they're planted in the past, so therefore we need to thin them out because they're, they're not natural. But the forest health stands, most of the logging that's um, slated to happen there, it says it's because of fire suppression efforts. So I don't know what that looks like. I haven't got to see those units yet, but um, there's something different with that prescription. And those are on very, very steep slopes. Um, and we have seen like avalanche shoots on some of those, so places where there is, you know, some, some movement happening. So those are a couple units that stand out for me too in this particular sale. Because there's a lot of roads that you know, you go and you'll, you'll just see a gate up, but behind that gate, it looks like a nice road. And that will be, they'll call that a closed road. Mm -hmm. That road essentially doesn't exist on any documentation. Oh. Whereas this road is considered a system road, which, you know, is, is not much of a road left there. Mm -hmm. um, but this is considered an open road. This is something that they, you know, are supposedly doing ma regular maintenance on. But obviously that probably hasn't happened since the last time they, they got in here. But I'd like to be standing here for another 800 years. And I'd like to watch the generations take root in the earth. And when I finally fall, I want to lay down and stay right here. Them beavers got it written up in their plans to haul me away on a truck next year. Now you folks ain't got no time to wait. Something must be done. I just stand here and take my feet because I cannot run. I cannot run. I cannot. For this next section, I want to talk about conifers. How's that sound? Yeah. Hey. All right, so help me out. What's a conifer then? I need to know what I'm going to talk about. They have cones. They have cones. Oh, okay. Evergreen. Conifer tree. Tend to be. They got cones most of the time. They're evergreen most of the time. What else? They don't lose their leaves. Yeah. Annually. Oh, yeah, they retain their leaves. They smell tasty. Most of the time. Most of the time. <laughs> Most of the time they smell tasty. Is softwood or hardwood a designation that's used for anything? Yeah. Um, hardwoods generally refer to deciduous trees or flowering trees. Yeah. And softwood generally refers to conifers. So if you say flowering trees, does that mean you don't flower? Well, not in the way we think of big flowers like a rose or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, most conifers, like we said, produce cones. But they produce male flowers and female flowers on the tree that are separate. And they tend to be wind pollinated. So they don't produce, they don't have that symbiotic thing with the bugs like, uh, like flowering plants do. They're not creating those sexy flowers and those nice scents going, hey, Mr. Bumblebee, check this out. So they're more, more just relying on the wind. We get our drought in the summer. 
you're a deciduous plant, it'll be a little rough on you. When you have your leaves out six months of the year and three months of that time span, there's no water or little water. That could be a little bit challenging. Studies have shown that a lot of our conifers do their thing in the winter too. As long as their uh, roots aren't frozen, they can often photosynthesize. They can pull up water and nutrients, put it up in the, uh, take it up top, facilitate some photosynthesis, get some growth happening. It's also pretty expensive to shed those leaves each year and grow new ones. If your hair fell out every year and you had to grow a whole new batch, better just to keep that. Conifers keep their needles, you know, five years. Um, folks, we're talking about, um, oh, I just lost Opal. it. Opal Creek. That's the largest intact old growth uh, forest uh, in Oregon, if not temperate rainforest period. Um, so that's a really, really great place to go. Um, in Mount Hood National Forest, there's a place called Big Bottom, which is extraordinary. And if you wanted to meet these cedars, like in their full shabam, that's the place to go. Giant place? old thousand year old cedars. It's called Big hey, Bottom. Big Bottom. Off the clack that place from the deep. Yeah. <laughs> don't tell anybody where it is. Yeah, yeah. You guys can know. Don't tell too many of your friends. I think we Jim went on a hike there once. Yeah, we've been on a hike. There. Gorgeous. Um, but yeah. So the other thing, conifers and just their, their immensity and dealing with our summer droughts is those bowls can hold a lot of water. So they can store water, like a swirl cactus. Yeah. yeah. Plumps out when the rains come and then slowly utilizes that. Our conifers can do that too. They can hold a lot of water in their stem and just slowly use that up. Yeah. When they're, when they're dead on the ground, they also can hold a lot as well. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's conifers. Yeah. We'll, we'll meet some trees that take advantage of that in a little while too. Because we are on that, uh, you know, that kind of rain shadow thing where the clouds come and they hit the mountains and they're like, oh, got to go up, got to go up. I'm getting heavier. I'm getting heavier. I'm not going to make it. Rain. And so a lot of these trees are able to take advantage of that. And then we get over to the east side, all the clouds, they, they reach the top of the mountain and they got nothing left. So those poor ponderosas, they just don't get as much rain. But fortunately they like it. So it works out well for them. So trees on the opposite side of the mountains have to contend with a lot less moisture because as the clouds try to rise up over that crest, they, they precipitate a lot. So as we're talking rain, we should segue into uh, our friend Western Red Cedar there. So you should go say hi. It's right there. Go up to it, say hi, check out the, check out the twigs, check out the bark. This tree can probably, and we can see by where it's uh, growing as well, but it can probably tolerate the shade more. And say, we see all these other trees around us, they've shed those, those, uh, those needles that are no longer getting any sunlight. So it brings us to a concept where trees can be uh, what's called shade tolerant, which means they can grow up in the shade of their friends. Or shade intolerant, like most of the bigger trees that we're seeing here, they come in after fire or some kind of disturbance. Their seeds have to germinate in direct sun. And most of those trees are the ones we think of that grow big fast, like Doug fir. Isn't that part of the rationale for clear cutting? To just wipe it out so they can throw a Doug fir in and it'll take off? Yeah, could, yeah, probably wouldn't surprise me. Right. Yeah. Though up here they're saying that they're going to log to diversify because there's too much Doug fir in some of these stands. So some of the trees that come in and hang out, though, with Doug fir, western hemlock, which we'll see in a little bit, um, and western red cedar, they need more of the shade of the overstory before they start to come in. So again, that kind of taps into what someone was sharing earlier about when you, um, when you thin the forest a little bit, you open it up and you change the microclimate a little bit. It could make life a little bit harder for this pair of cedars here. Um, you know, unless they were able to buffer them and so forth. So if we were working in true uh, di conifer diversity or what have you, it'd be good to uh, create a buffer around these to uh, to give them a little extra protection. How do you guys know that's Western Red Cedar? Well, that's the importance of this. Establish your own relationship and what works for you. Because I can tell you it's Western Red Cedar, or Thurducha Placata, look it, features A, B, C, and D, and then you'll know it's it. But it's more important to be checking it out on your own and, and to uh, establish that. Because if it's like a transformer face that works for you, tell us about them. should I? Yeah. Yes. You could. Let's talk about identification a little bit more, and then we will. Um, so this is a younger tree and um, yeah, like I said, go to Big Bottom or somewhere like that where you can see these old cedars and you can get an idea of what the bark looks like. But it's starting to suggest it a little bit where when these barks get, or when the trunk gets mature, it has these brown stringy barks. It looks like they peel off in strips and often will. The base of the trunk is often buttressed where it'll come down and it'll get kind of wide at the base. 
The cedars have a really wide, wider root system than other trees. Um, if, we, if we were lucky enough to see some of the cones, and cones are one of the best things for identifying trees. Um, the cones, when closed up, they kind of look like a smoker's pipe or like the bowl of a pipe. And then as they kind of open to release the seeds, they look like kind of like a small wooden rose. And they're small too, like half an inch or so. Um, and unlike a lot of, a lot of conifers, the, the cones dangle down and the red cedar will sit erect. So those little roses or pipe buds, um, pipe bowls, there we go, um, would sit upright, they would point upwards. Um, another thing that stands out for me is if you look at the branching pattern, it kind of has this J thing going on where the branches come out, they swoop down and then they kind of kick up right at the tips. Most of the trees we'll see are in a, in a larger grouping called the, uh, related to the pine family. So more of the needle conifers. These ones are often called false cedars. Um, Cause again, some of these uh, common names are a bit of a misnomer. There's a lot of plants called cedars and cedar essentially means aromatic wood. Most conifers are pretty aromatic. So cedar is something that gets thrown around a lot. So this and its friend incense cedar and Alaskan cedar are often known as the false cedars. So um, this particular one, the genus is Thusia, and it's Thusia placata, or western red cedar. Um, and to your question, yes, it had a mountain of uses. Um, western red cedar has probably the, you know, if you pick up a book on ethnobotany, so how Native Americans used plants, like half of that book will probably be western red cedar. Oh. Um, one of the common names for red cedars in general, and there's a couple other species within that genus, is arbor vitae, which means the tree of life. Which is really fitting for this. You know, these trees were used as antifungals, uh, as immune stimulants. Uh, they made clothes out of them, babies diapers. The, it was a key one for um, canoes and so forth. Um, and if you get lucky enough to see some big giant uh, red cedars, you'll see that they don't have everything growing on them like we'll see on all these other trees that are just coated with lichens and so forth. So you can kind of suggest that they're, they're antibacterial or they're antifungal properties. They're pretty potent. And it's a nice soft wood uh, that's easy to carve, yet it lasts for years and years and years. Um, another interesting thing about Western red cedar, it was called uh, shabalup, which means keeps you dry. So it's an indigenous name for the plant. So if, if you're out in a rainstorm, which probably pretty often coming up in these mountains, uh, western red cedar could be your friend. Where do you normally find western red cedar? Presumably you're going to say the coast. <laughs> yeah, it does like the coast. Damp areas. Near water. Yeah, generally likes its feet wet. So it's a good one to know if you, you know, especially out, you know, maybe if you're checking out timber cells and stuff and you see a chunk of cedar in the distance, Maybe there's a little bog there. You see a nice linear run of cedar? Probably gonna find a creek or some kind of uh, water flow in there. But I've been standing here for 800 years. And if I had me some eyes, they'd be welling up with tears. I heard a rumor take away. big beaver coming to cut me down you take a mighty big beaver to lay this grandma down you take a mighty big beaver to lay this grandma down you take a mighty big beaver down to lay me down and take a mighty big beaver to lay me down and take a mighty big beaver <laughs> to lay me down and take a mighty big beaver to lay me down and take a mighty to lay me down. It could be an old, an old road. Um, 
could be an old skid trail too. Um, and a skid trail is a place where uh, a tractor will come through, a uh, skidder, that's what they call it, skid trail. The skidder would come through and it would grab the trees and drag them out of the forest. And so there's a lot of back and forth where they directionally fall the trees towards this skid trail and the skidders will um, pull the trees out of the forest. And so that creates a, another linear path through the forest. And oftentimes with these, with these logging projects, when they're doing ground-based logging, so they're logging with tractors or heavy machines, um, you'll see a skid trail approximately every 150 feet. So when we're talking about roads and compaction and soil loss, um, you know, creating disturbance for habitat and stuff, skid trails, as we can see, are just about as persistent as roads. Um, these skid trails last on the landscape for quite some time. Probably wasn't until they last got in this area and logged that this, this was utilized. So we're looking at 50, 60 years, probably since this road has been, or skid trail has been utilized. Well, how come this has less grow over than the place that we were just eating lunch then, if it's been the same amount of time? Why it has less vegetation or? Yeah. Yeah, um, that one they ripped. So they actually took some kind of machinery and tilled it up and probably didn't do that here. So, you know, we still saw down in the road base, there was some St. John's wort and some weeds down in the road. But up here, we can see the native vegetation is, is starting to, to come back. But again, like they would reuse the road down there, they generally reuse the skid trails too. So they would probably be um, utilizing this area if they came in here, if they're ground basing this log, this unit. Um, and then if you're looking on your map and kind of wondering where we're at, the, the creek is just down there. And oftentimes if you're out ground truthing or out looking at these areas they're proposing to log, it's generally pretty clear. Um, if you look off in the distance there, we can see an abrupt line and the forest changes there quite a bit. It's a lot more sunnier up the hill slope there. And that's going to be probably the end of our unit. Because generally in these areas, it's, it's by age class and such. So um, it's helpful for navigation if you do want to come out and check out these areas. If gonna log. Generally what we see when they um, do uh, restoration logging in these plantations, we'll see a, a reduction of 30, um, or excuse me, they'll get it down to what they call canopy closure, about 30%. So probably just the way to think about that is imagine like seven of 10 trees going. It doesn't yeah. really look like it needs to be thinned. Come yeah, and, and that is the, the, um, the, the rationale often is if you thin those trees, you get release, right? So, you know, if you guys um, garden, you, you have carrots, right? And then you pluck out every other one because they're growing too close together. So you thin them out so they grow bigger faster, right? But generally, when you when your carrot beds, you don't walk around in your beds. You know, you don't smash everything down. So we do get that when we get, we get these clear linear paths that go through the forest, we get that kind of compaction and sedimentation and stuff out here too. So um, that is the rationale is that we're gonna grow bigger trees faster to, to grow old growth faster. Um, there are some, the, some issues that I have with that. You know, some of this, like we can see here, um, a small dead tree, that one's not gonna be much for habitat. But as this forest, if it was allowed to naturally succeed, there would be competition going on. Some of these trees would lose out in that and they would die and they would become habitat for, for different critters up here. And it's something about a third of the birds and about a third of the mammals will use um, these old dead trees at some point in their lifespan. And then these dead trees, you know, they stand, you know, they say a tree takes about as long to, to die as it does to live. So, you know, something like a you know, a hundred year old dug fir could stand 50 years as a snag serving as habitat. Then it's gonna hit the ground to become downed wood, decomposed and provide habitat for a whole other host of critters too. So when we go through and we thin the plantation, we lose that. We, we take away those, um, those snags and we take away those, um, those downed logs for, for, for years to come. Because it's gonna be a while before this canopy closes and that, that competitive process happens again. Um, and then the other thing with that is all that this area that we're standing in is designated as matrix, which means that the, the prime motive for this piece of earth is to log it. So it makes me kind of wonder like, you know, are you thinning it to create old growth faster or are you thinning it to create bigger trees to log sooner? Um, it's, you know, we, we, at Bark, we also work with the BLM and they're much more forthright in that. They're like, we need wood. We're gonna log because we're gonna get wood. And the Forest Service will, will say that they're doing it to improve habitat. But when we're, we're standing on matrix ground, I, I wonder if, if that is factual or not. One of the things I noticed when I went out with Megan is we went into a place that had been so-called thin. The air 
it's it's so much hotter and more arid so the things that we were seeing on the floor weren't native plantings they were thistle and like all these invasive species because that's all that can grow under those kind of harsh conditions so it's not what are they restoring i mean they're not it's not taking the trees out to let other trees grow the other side of that is they're also uh, altering the, the temperature and the hum relative humidity in those stands so that it's not really going to be good uh, a good environment for the trees to grow in. I mean, they, what they want are this kind of like cool understory, right? Doesn't that help, help them? Yeah. Yeah, we definitely change the dynamics and, and that is one thing. It opens up the forest and makes a drier habitat. So it might, it's going to affect the succession. Um, there'll be a lot of different plants that'll come in in the understory than, than would if left alone. Um, and that was one thing too when I was just walking through this. Um, most of my time as a botanist I spend looking down. So, um, so this tree thing is new for me. It's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a really diverse area for, for a younger uh, stand of trees. I'm seeing a lot of different herbaceous and, and woody shrubs in the understory. Um, and so I do get concerned when, um, when logging is going to happen in, in areas like this. Um, it is fairly easy to walk through. I personally wouldn't call it too dense. Um, um, and yeah, and I just don't think it's a risk to, to lose those uh, native plants that seem to be pretty happy here in the understory. Um, yeah, and that's, that's a really good point. Um, and it is a, a good thing to bring up uh, another point that Bark has been working on, uh, another project that we've been working on, is we've been monitoring forests post-logging. Um, as you might know, when the, when the Mount Hood National Forest logs these areas, it's not National Forest staff, it's not federal employees that log this. What they do is they plan the timber sale. They go through that process of planning the timber sale, doing all the environmental analysis. They often have to do the things like constructing the road and tearing the road out when they're done. Um, so they do all that legwork, and when that's done, they auction it off to a private company who comes in and logs these forests. And so oftentimes with these stewardship contracts, a lot of that work is being done by a private entity. So, for example, um, they'll mark trees. They'll decide which trees get cut and which trees get to stay. And I get concerned that if it's a private company that's doing that, I think that economic incentive is going to override the ecological incentive. So like if a forester was out here marking these trees, they're going to be able to look up and go, yeah, that one's got a broken top. That's probably going to be pretty kick-ass for habitat or, um, you know, here's a nice little pocket with, you know, a wet marshy area or whatever. Let's, let's buffer that off. Um, but when it's a private, you know, if you're out and you're a timber company, I mean, part of your work is to make a buck. So it changes that, it changes that outlook on things. So when we just kind of keep that in mind, too, that it is private companies that come out and log public forests. When, when you say a private company, it's not like a whole team of, like, because people talk about jobs from logging. It's not like a whole team of guys with chainsaws, is it? It's more like really big multi-ton equipment that's going in and cutting. Is, is that... Yeah, the, the project is quite uh, mechanized now. Yeah. Um, you know, there is some, you know, like folks marking trees and uh, planting sales and then doing mitigation work after. Mm -hmm. uh, but mostly just for the logging part, it is just... Uh, generally, it's a harvester, which is one machine that comes through and cuts the trees, and a skitter is another machine that drags them out. Um, and then you have, you know, maybe someone at the landing getting them on the trucks, and then and then your truck drivers and so forth. I've heard feller bunchers take <clears throat> seven jobs out of the forest or something like that. So the number of jobs produced is way less. Yes. And yeah, I mean, they, when they do job comparisons, a lot of times they <clears throat> compare felling of the big old trees where you had two guys there, one watching the tree and another one doing the saw and then they're both standing back, you know, kind of like, you know, what's going on? Are we going to live through this? And, you know, you know, this tree's gone, chunk, that one's gone. It's, yeah. it's a whole different way of doing business these days. So yeah. Yeah, very few jobs. Yeah. That'd be a fun YouTube project when you get home. Look up Feller Buncher and you can watch them cutting the trees. Um, but part, uh, and it is, it's really, it's really a potent thing to see. Um, and part of the reason I was leading into this is because we are going back to these timber sales now and seeing um, what they look like after they've been logged and looking at the effects of that. The Forest Service puts these protocols forth called best management practices that are supposed to dictate the way a private company goes through and logs the forest. There's all these things like that you have to do, like you have to decommission a road before the rains come. Um, you have to try and protect snags to the best of your ability. Or on these old skid trails, you're supposed to throw slash on the top to prevent soil from eroding. 
Um, so we have invited Megan here from um, Drew University, and she's uh, an ecology student, and she's been uh, helping us establish protocols. I shouldn't say helping, doing, uh, creating these protocols that we're going to be using um, through this coming fall when the rains come, uh, which is when you know a lot of these problems with logging operations uh, would manifest. So we're creating these protocols so that we can go back post-logging and see the effects of that, because we're. Um, you know, we, we keep hearing that we're logging for restoration. We're going to create old growth faster. Is that happening? We don't know. I mean, we've only been thinning forests for, you know, on this scale for the last 10, maybe 20 years. So long term, ecologically, we, we don't have those answers yet. But we know that the logging today, skid trails and roads, they're causing problems today. And are those worth those long term benefit? I, I hesitate to call that restoration in the least, um, just to say that we are restoring the forests. So there's not a great need for wood right now. Um, most of the wood that's coming out of state lands and off of private lands is just getting shipped, abo uh, shipped abroad. Most of it's going to China and Korea. And worse yet, it's not even getting processed here. It's not even getting milled or anything like that here. So again, kind of back to that jobs thing, you know, there's, there's more jobs lost. Um, national forest wood stays domestic. It's, it's milled and supposedly sold in the United States, but that gets a little bit hard to monitor. Once it comes off of the Forest Service property, or you know, once the Forest Service has sold it to someone, it's hard to follow it down that chain. Um, so it's hard to say where that goes, but we could fill the needs, the domestic needs, if we, if we pulled from state forests or from private forests, um, and we wouldn't need to do this logging here. Um, purely based on a wood need, because that is, that is quite down right now. There is a disease of wicked proportion Love of money and gold It's cure will never be had This is a pine. It's in the genus Pinus. And um, this is western white pine, Pinus monticola. And hopefully we'll get to see some smaller ones along the road so we can get up and, and personal with their, and their needles. But pines, as a general rule, have needles in packets. And so if we look at some of these duck firs right here up against the road, you'll see that the needles come off the tree singularly. So each needle comes directly off of the branch. When you look at a pine, you'll see that there's like, basically like a tiny branch, a little small stub. And then off that stub, you'll see the needles will come off in packages of two or three or five. And Western white pine is one of our five, um, five needle uh, pines in our area. And that coupled with the fact that it has kind of a bluish green U and the giant cone is pretty descriptive of the Western white pine. The only other pine that has a cone that competes with that is the sugar pine, and they're a little bit south of our area. They barely kind of come into Mount Hood National Forest, um, but they're a pine that likes uh, lower elevation forests. So they're generally about 2,000 feet on west side forests, um, but they also have giant cones, generally over a foot long, whereas these are like, what, seven inches to a foot? Um, so yeah, giant pine, giant cone pines, needles in five, tend to have a bluish green U to them. Um, they do like a little bit higher elevations, as I guess I will just continue saying for the next few trees we talk about, since we came up and all. Um, they often like their feet just a little bit wet too. So they will range on the east side if they are in kind of like a wetter habitat. But they more like these wetter, wetter mount, higher mountain forests. 
But what is really interesting about western white pine, and pines in general, if we kind of are exploring an area and we want to get an idea, like how old is this stand? How old are these trees here? Pines pretty conveniently produce one ring of uh, leaves or one ring of branches each year. So we can look at a pine tree and just merely count all the way up the tree for each of those rings and figure out a year of growth. We can also look back and go, man, eight years ago, that was a dang good year. That tree put on, you know, 12 inches or whatever, but three years ago or four years ago, that's a little snug up there. So maybe not quite a good, uh, good season for it. The other thing you might notice back in the background here, over here to the right, you'll see one that's a little bit more yellow. And then there's a younger one back there that has bright red foliage. Anyone know what's going on? So you guys maybe have heard of the chestnut blight and the elm blight. Pretty much brought both of those species of trees to, the, to their knees. Um, we have um, white pine blister rust, which has taken out a lot of western white pines in our area. It's another European import that attacks five needle pines. And um, our, trees don't, or our ecosystem doesn't supply the host or anything to combat that. It's a really interesting fungus that attacks it. The, the fungus initially, the spores germinate on a ribes, on a currant or a gooseberry, and then they sporulate from there. Those spores are released and attack another ribes or currant, has to be a different plant, and then it creates another spore, and that spore attacks the western white pine. And then the western white pine, when we start to see that yellowing and that redding, it's, it's called flagging, and that's a good indication that something's gone wrong. And the blister rust, you'll generally see a discoloration on the bark, generally like a yellowish tannish color. And then when, it, when the spores are produced, basically blisters happen and they erupt. And then the spores just kind of come out from there. And then again, when those spores are released, they got to set up shop on a currant or a gooseberry. So it's a pretty interesting thing for a fungus. Most fungus are like, you know, I'm athlete's foot. I want your feet. But this one's like, yeah, I like currants. I also like five needle pines. I'll take some of both. Mm -hmm. So there are currants here then. What's that? There's got to be some kind of currants here. Then. Yeah. And so this is uh, the eastern white pine especially, Pinus strobilus, was a major, major tree species uh, for harvesting. And when folks found out, ooh, they got this five needle pine in the Pacific Northwest too, this became a target as well. Um, so there has been a lot of effort to, to deal with that disease. And one of the ways they've been doing it is like, we're just going to get rid of uh, ribes. No more currants, no more gooseberries. We'll take care of that host and then our white pines will thrive. That didn't work too well. And did try to do that for like 20 years or so. And ribes and currants are pretty tough. You probably find those coming up in old skid trails and stuff. They, they sprout pretty readily after fires and after you cut them to the ground. So that didn't work out too well for them. So there has been some talk, and we've been hearing this in the Hood River District, that they're trying to cultivate a variety that's uh, rust resistant to plant up here. So take that as you will. One of the reasons we keep hearing that they're logging in these areas is because they're plantations. These are areas that they, they planted, they're not natural, so we need to get in there and log it and correct that. So I get a little suspicious when it's like, okay, well, we're going to start planting another tree, western white pine. On the other hand, it's a beautiful tree, and I want to see more of them in our mountains. So it, it is kind of that conundrum. We, 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 that line we walk as human beings. Uh, we, want, we don't want to eradicate certain species. But oftentimes it's our tinkering that, that tips, tips that, uh, you know, tips the balance. So that is part of the proposal up here to thin, to potentially get these, um, to introduce western white pines that have been nur nursery stock essentially up here in these mountains. Sometimes we have success with that, sometimes not. I know in the Clackamas they're growing dug firs at, you know, you know, sea level 500 feet. Then they take them up 3,000 feet up in the mountains and those trees are like, uh, I've never seen snow before. I can't deal with this. We're going to do an exercise of this to figure out what this tree is because this book is, it used to be like five bucks for this little floppy binder thing, but I saw at Paddles the other day, they just came out with a, um, a new version of it, new edition, and it's got kind of more like the po jar, a nice like waterproof covering. It has just a lot of great information about trees. And what I really, really like about it and what y'all are going to do is on page 11, on this graph, there is a breakdown, what we call a botanical key. And botanical keys work a lot like those uh, Which Way books or Choose Your Own Adventure. You guys ever read those? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you enter the cave. Are you going to slay the dragon? Turn to page 12. Or are you going to run and hightail it out of there? Turn to page 27. 
And then you turn to page 27 and then you're dead. And so then you go back to page nine where you were and then go back to 12. Keys kind of work like that too. Basically what it is, it's like, does your tree have yellow flowers? Does your tree have white flowers? If it has yellow flowers, go to number four. If it has white flowers, go to number seven. And so we just basically, by process of elimination, will it down to whatever we're looking at. And it looks like these guys are on a roll. Anyone else want to join them? Lost touch with reality. Open to find a mystic tree. Let's go.